Okay, my life is going to take over, and I'm sure you're going to have a treat. That's our school. Hello, friends. Good to see you again. All right, so we got, we got very good feedback about last year's conference, right? And uh, uh, I'm kind of curious, who, who still remembers anything about uh, the Narden Declaration that we formulated together? Yeah? C could you tell us what you remember? <laughs> and, and could you please get, stand up because there's the video guys asked me to, yeah. I, and this is not, this is not uh, an exam or anything. Just if, if you can, oh, can no. provide us one or two keywords, something, something that, that, that stayed with you. Cross-pollination. Yeah, oh, <laughs> Cross-pollination. <laughs> oh, excellent. It's a key word, right? Cross-pollination. Now, uh, um, what do we as individual theosophists and as different theosophical organizations need to do to be successful in cross-pollinating together? What is necessary? What does it take from us? Nectar. Nectar. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a gentleman in the back. He would like to have the phone, the, the mic, because tell us about the nectar, please. <laughs> and, and, and stand up, because if, if for the video, we would like yeah, to see yeah. you. Okay. The nectar is, is the essential oil of wisdom. Uh -huh that we pass on from one flower to the other. Yep. Great. And in that, there is a alchemical process that takes place that shows up as ITC, well, that's, that's, a, a unity that coming almost together. That poetic, David. <laughs> and, and, but, but help me just a little bit. Yeah. What, what does it take from us to be able to share ah. that essential wisdom? Courage. Courage. <laughs> I like that word very much. Yeah. Why courage? Why courage? Yeah. Because usually uh, it takes active, uh, you know, it, it takes the engagement of our will to go out and, and touch others, I think. Excellent. It's, it's not really Excellent. easy sometimes. You no, know. it's not. Yeah. Excellent. So, so it takes courage. What, what else does it take? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's very simple. To, let's, let's, go, go. let's go to Jacques for, uh, for a second. Yes. And, and Jack, please stand up, please. No. Sorry. 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 Yeah, thank you. Once we have the nectar, uh -huh. we need the bees. Uh -huh. <laughs> and we need some special bees who are willing to visit some unknown flower. Ah, uh -huh. all right. About 182,000 flowers, I think I heard before, right? Okay, what else? Okay. Case. Ah, training for the job, because the queen has uh, her, her ideas. Yes, but uh, we, we have to be ready for her, Great. for the job. So, so we have. We to can train. We can we, practice we, uh, in our own uh, uh, environment, own groups. Sounds great. Yeah. So, how do we do that? Train in, in cross pollination. So we can we can train courage, right? That's that's one thing we can train. How, how, what else can we do to train? Really listen to each other and um, willing to understand what the other is telling us. Ah, so, so this is not just normal listening, but it's a different kind of listening, right? Yes, it's really uh, listening with your heart. Listening not, with not your heart. On, not only with the, ah. listen to the word, but uh, listen to the ideas uh, someone wants to bring over. Excellent. Yes, yeah, so listen with our hearts. What else? If we listen with our hearts, what else do we need to do? Who remembers what April talked about last year? April? Couldn't come this year, but we're missing her, but she's here in spirit. We need to speak from the heart as well, right? So, so what does it take from us to speak from the heart besides courage? Compassion. Compassion. Bim? Yeah, you, yeah. Please stand up. I'm, I'm sorry. It's, it's, yeah. for, it's for the video. So, yes. Compassion. C compassion. That's all. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> Key word, compassion. Okay. Well, we have to communicate that. Uh -huh. We have to, to share that. We and, have to and, communicate that. And in order to communicate, that. we have to stand up. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's how it works. Communication is a very important thing, of course. We have to speak to each other and with an open mind, of course. Excellent. To accept other ideas to change our own ideas, maybe, 
That is very important. And uh, the communication from person to person. So that is important why we are here. We have this wonderful possibility here to exchange our ideas. And I think we are all in the mood to do it in the right way. Oh, that yes. means in a brotherly way. And uh, with this, I think, I think we, we can set an example for our own homes and countries and wherever we go to, to do it in this way, open-minded and, uh, uh, yeah. That sounds excellent. And, 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 and after these fantastic ideas and words, uh, I, I need to uh, give you a, a little bit of a secret. We were supposed to save this until Sunday, but since Herman was already talking about his pet project, which is uh, the optic fiber cables that he wants to have to the States and to Brazil, <laughs> uh, there, there's, an, there's another pet project. Um, we need big donations for this one because we want to have at least 100 microphones <laughs> next year for all of the speakers. That's you, right? Um, so, so tonight, uh, in the good tradition that we started last year, we again have an audience of three people who will be here on stage, which is Herman Vermeulen, Gene Dennings, <laughs> and John Knebel. Um, and what are we going to do? You uh, had in your uh, uh, envelope, you don't have to take it out, but there's a letter. Um, we're going to read this together. Uh, we're going to, first of all, get an introduction from John. We're going to read it together, and we're going to see what it means for us, what it means for the Theosophical Movement, and what it means for our future. And let's see if we can uh, give some good statements and some good questions to our panel here on the stage. John? Since we were bringing greetings, I'll kick off with greetings from the Wheaton headquarters of the TSA. Um, nobody else was representing them, so here I am. <laughs> um, many of you know that I've taken on the project of the, the old Blavatsky Letters Project. The, we're talking about publishing the personal letters of H.P. Blavatsky. Now, many of you have been encouraging me, and many of you are supporting me, and I thank you all so much for that, I think. Um, the project that I'm talking about actually began back in 1924, when Boris Dzerkov be began collecting all of the literary output of H.P. Blavatsky. Many people have heard that Boris was her nephew or her great nephew. Actually, Boris was a second cousin twice removed, but I, I do believe he was the last living relative of H.P.B. By the time of his death in 1981, he had published uh, 12 volumes of her public writings, her journal articles, her letters to editors, that sort of thing. And that's um, just the tip of the iceberg. That was published as the collected writings of H.P. Mlavatsky. But thanks to the work of Mrs. Dara Eklund, who is watching on the internet. Hi, Dara. <laughs> God bless you. God. Uh, <laughs> Dara finished that project, publishing volumes 13 and 14, and a cumulative index to the Collected Writings Project. However, Boris's collection of HPB's personal correspondence remained in manuscript form. Seven large folios, and their unedited unpublished. Now, that project has laid dormant for some time, got passed around a little bit, but finally Dr. John Algio, at that time president of the TSA, took on the project and then finally in 2003 published the first of what I believe to be four volumes of her personal correspondence. By the way, there's two volumes of, the, uh, or two copies of the first volume back there on the table, if anybody's interested. Um, 
My job then is to continue that project. Now that means editing and preparing for publication, the rest of Boris's work and any, anything else that came to light since Boris's death. Now HPB was a prolific writer. Uh, in addition to her five major works in seven volumes and the 14 volumes of her public works, there's probably gonna be four more volumes of her personal letters. She wrote to family and friends back in Russia. She wrote to theosophists in India, both the native pandits and the Anglo-Indian community then in India. She wrote to theosophists in Europe, in Germany, in France, in Great Britain. She also wrote to theosophists in America, the United States. Sometimes her letters were lighthearted, frivolous, just as anybody's personal correspondence might be. She wrote about her travels throughout India. She always wrote about her health issues. It was almost expected if you got a letter from HPB, you'd hear about what her current ailment was. Um, but sometimes she was irritated or angry. Sometimes the letter was really a rant about something that was going on, somebody that was uh, doing something she didn't want them doing, or uh, somebody had libeled her in a newspaper or something like that. She would um, complain loudly. But sometimes, but not very often, she would write about the teachings in her personal letters. More. Uh, most often to correct a misconception or somebody would ask her a question and she would clarify something. Uh, but it, those little snippets are few and far between. But they're still there and they're still very valuable. So uh, what we have in this collection of personal letters is the beginnings, first off, of a biography of HPB in her own words, uh, in her own style, It'd be the raw material for a biography. And it's also a, the same sort of seed for a history of the early society. So the letters in themselves are a wonderful chronicle of, of what was going on. Um, over the past year, I've gathered the manuscript material from many sources. Um, starting with Boris's seven volumes, but there are other things around. And I have since prepared a pretty clean manuscript for what would be volume two after John Algio's volume one. Um, I still need to write a few essays and, and continue the work. Uh, I also have gathered the support of the TSA. Uh, I had to uh, prepare a regular business proposition, a book proposal, and a budget, so forth. And through that, I've been uh, supported financially for research in London. Uh, and in October, I'll be going off to Adyar to see what we can uh, find there before anything is published. Um, I expect volume two to be available sometime in 2016. So we don't have to wait forever. It's been. 12 years, 12 and a half years since volume was, one was published, 2003. And then volumes three and four will follow. The letter that I've chosen for us to read tonight is somewhat obscure. Some, I was very pleased to see that some people have read this and studied this letter. Uh, it's a fragment of a letter. It was probably re written in late in her life, probably around 1889 or 90. Uh, remember, that's after a lot of turmoil. We also do not know who, to whom it was addressed. I know that it was an American. It was most likely William Kwan Judge, uh, but it possibly could have been Miss Julia Keatley. On the first anniversary of HPB's death, she 
uh, Miss Julia Keatley gave a presentation in New York for the first White Lotus Day. And in this presentation, she quoted from many letters, many personal letters from HPB. Um, she didn't give any references, so we don't know where these letters came from or where they are today. We don't know who they were to or what date they were written. But she uh, quoted from many of them in this address. Then that following year, in June, July, and August, these, this uh, address was published in the path. The address was titled, She Being Dead Yet Speaketh. There's a bunch of wonderful letters there, but this one I've chosen. Have you all got it out of your envelopes here? Because we want to read along. Uh, this letter is meant to be a Kickstarter here for what we're doing this weekend. Uh, there's many comments in here that, that we need to talk about. Um, remember, though, that HPB at this time in her life, had been betrayed by Madame Cologne. She'd been labeled a fraud by Richard Hodgson in his SPR report. She'd been abandoned by many friends. Uh, many people felt that the Theosophical Society would be much better off without her, and we can do it better. So she was a little bitter at this time. So please excuse her bitterness in this, in this letter. Give her a break. So, are we ready? She wrote, To live like cats and dogs in the TS is positively against all rules. And wishes of the masters, as against our brotherhood, so-called, and its rules. They are disgusted. They look on, and in that look, O oh Lord, if you could only see it as I have, there's an ocean deep of sad disgust, contempt, and sorrow. The ideal was besmeared with mud, but as it is no golden idol on feet of clay, it stands to this day immovable. And what the profane see is only their own mud thrown with their own hands, and which has created a veil, an impassable barrier between them and the ideal, without touching the latter. Have a large society. The more the better. All that is chaff and husk is bound to fall away in time. All that is grain will remain. But the seed is in the bad and evil man as well as in the good ones. Only it is more difficult to call into life and cause it to germinate. The good husbandman does not stop to pick out the seeds from the handful. He gives them all their chance. And even some of the half rotten seeds come to life when thrown into good soil. Be that soil. Look at me, the universal theosophical manure, the rope for whose hanging and lashing is made out of the flax I have sown, and each strand of it is, tw and each strand it is twisted of represents a mistake so-called, of mine. Hence, if you fail only nine times out of ten in your selections, you are successful one time out of ten. And that's more than many other theosophists can say. Those few true souls will be the nucleus for future success, and their children will. Let us sow seed, and if evil crops up, it will be blown away by the wind, like all other things in this life, in its time. There's much there that we should talk about.
Does anybody have anything they'd like to comment on this letter? Oh, one, one thought that struck me was that part where it talks about not uh, picking the, the half bad seeds from the good seeds and throwing them all, giving them all that chance. And it just, just reminds me that we don't really know who other people are essentially when we meet them and we often judge too quickly. And, and I think this is shown in the philosophy often when, as it said, the, the right uh, environment awakened uh, these half rotten seeds, so to speak. So, um, so to be that manure is really, uh, you know, something that we should take seriously and not be too judgmental of others, but uh, offer all we can uh, the same opportunity, you know, which, which, which for us is theosophy. So uh, anyway, that's, that's what struck me strongly. Well, in the middle of the letter, it makes the point uh, that the seed is in the bad and evil man as well in, as in the good ones, only is more difficult to call into life and cause it to germinate. It seems that's a very important idea that we all too quickly forget because we do easily condemn the bad man and there's some pretty bad men doing some bad things right now, but um, we have to keep affirming the, the light, the self, the, uh, the wisdom that is in every human soul and realize that condemning or separating ourselves from the bad and evil man is not a wise path. It will only produce more exaggerated karma. And that, um, as it's been said, both within the teaching and, as I understand it, by the Buddha and the Dalai Lama, um, the so-called bad man may be your best teacher. So you have to remember that. And to remember it not with a, you know, a sour push face, um, but it could, it's a great source of um, hopefulness that you can work with anybody, uh, appreciate any, anybody, and really see them as a fellow human being on a pilgrimage, for each has many rocks and cl uh, cliffs and dangers, but it is more of a, uh, it takes more courage and it is more important perhaps uh, to help the bad and evil man without overdoing it in terms of your own uh, potential. You don't want to walk into something that's way over your head. <laughs> so that's just a comment. Let me comment on those, uh, David and Carolyn. Remember that when HPB arrived in India, she didn't go to the British. She went to the Indian, and she would, um, tried to contact as many and learn as much and communicate as much as she could with the Indians. Um, compare that to A.P. Sinnott when he went back to London, felt that it was absolutely a waste of time to teach theosophy to the lower classes. He only wanted the upper class, the proper gentlemen and ladies, to be a member of the society, folks who would dress up for the meetings. So there's a, a world of difference there between the way HPB approached the spread of theosophy and Mr. Sinnott back in London. But, but for me, it is also another message in it is that you net, if you spread the uh, theosophy, you can never say, okay, this is a guy is coming out of jail, we don't do it. So that means if everybody has still the seed in them, you should help them to uh, fertilize, to germinate that particular part in himself and not condemn them because you have something and so on. So we say in our organization always, the past of a person is not interest at all. It is just you're coming in and from now on what you are doing. Yeah, and if you are open to it, et cetera, et cetera. 
What is interesting for me in this letter is that it, it starts with to live like cats and dogs in the TS, and that is a meaning too. Because until now we talked about the general attitude a person, uh, we, we, all, we very often have towards uh, other people, and that's not to, uh, only towards uh, other theosophists, but to, to everybody. And uh, I think she has here that special idea about the behavior of one theosophist to the other. How we think about our fellows in other organizations or uh, uh, our comrades in other uh, uh, streams of theosophy inside the theosophical movement. So that for me is very important. And, and the end, uh, of course, is also a hope, and um, where she said, um, if, if, if you fall down uh, uh, nine times of ten, at least one time, you have done a good job, yeah? And I think for, for, for especially for our gathering here at ITC, uh, for me, it is a source of joy that we don't live anymore like cats and dogs, but we really took it up, what she asked us, to try to live together in the right mood, in the right way. And so we are already standing up the tenth time. <laughs> so one time out of ten. Yeah. Well, I... I would just like to say there are two words here that, that I, just, I just love. One is sorrow, <laughs> and the other is ideal. And the sentence is, and I'm going to read it backwards, the ideal was besmeared with mud. And because it was, they had sorrow. And the whole world, at least from this perspective, is in those two words, ideal, and what that truly represents, that is the common ground that we've been talking about since we started, and the sorrow that we experience as compassionate human beings because we can see it, we understand it to some degree, and yet we can't stop it fully. And so, Hopefully, by doing an effort like this, as everyone is pointing out, we can change that tendency that is a natural karmic tendency in our lower nature as opposed to our ideal, which is more a reality than the matter that we use to work through. I do like that. Uh, description that HPB uses, they are disgusted, they look on. Uh, there's an ocean of deep, sad disgust, contempt, and sorrow. In working with the Mahatma letters, I don't think disgust would be the right word. I know that uh, HPB's Master Moria would be sometimes sharp with folks, but um, KH had this loving pity, perhaps, not a disgust. So let's blame this on HPBs being cranky. Uh, they had nothing but compassion for orphan humanity. But I can see that how it would be distressing to put forth this experiment, this uh, uh, projection into the world of the ancient teachings and, and see us fighting like cats and dogs. Brotherhood starts at home. Uh, well, I remember uh, uh, in the, I think it was the third of the fourth letter, that uh, uh, Kuthumi was really disgusted about drunken six in India, in Amritsar. So I don't think you have to blame it on the Blavatsky, but uh, <laughs> what I want to say is that um, uh, I think this letter is not bitter. It's a really realistic letter with a lot of hope in it. It's, yes. In fact, it's a very optimistic letter, I think, because she speaks about a nucleus for future generations. And we have to learn, I think, that theosophy was not meant for a couple of years, not for a century, 
but for many, many, many centuries to come. And it's a very interesting uh, thing I read in the, the letter of the Mahachana we discussed uh, last year. He was talking about uh, the, the sons and the daughters of theosophists are the first ones to become theosophists as well. Well, in fact, she says here the same thing. Mm -hmm. If we, and I don't think you have to take sons and daughters literally, but the future generations, if we teach them well, if we can make theosophy a living power in our lives, and we form that nucleus of universal brotherhood, that's so important to form it, and we spread theosophy, it will last for the, for the next generations to come during not centuries, but millennia. And I think that picture was in Blavatsky's mind. She didn't look for the first years, but she, she, she was looking for centuries to come. So, and if you look at it in that way, it's a very optimistic letter. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of curious because uh, I, I like the optimistic outlook, but, but, but I think uh, I, there's a big challenge for us here right, as, as an ITC to, to form that nucleus. And she's also talking about manure and about <laughs> soil. So, so what does that mean for us as an, as an ITC organization or gathering? What? She gave a nice explanation about if we look outside. But how about here in this, <coughs> this context? Where's the manure? What's the soil here? She talks about mud. Mm -hmm. And you would think the mud is from the outside, but the mud is, where is it coming from? The ideal was besmeared with mud. What the profane see is only their own mud, mm -hmm. thrown with their own hands. Do we think of it that way? which has created a veil. So the cats and dogs that we see, those, that's the mud of our own making. Can I react on that and on Jean? Uh, it is uh, an esoteric rule that if you start working together, everything is very rosy and okay, till the moment that you grow in a faster way. Your karma is accelerated because you uh, lose some of your personality and then something happens within you. And the first thing uh, that happens is that you see in your fellow workers, and we are that in a sense when we are sitting here, you see negative things. You don't see the world negative, you don't see the, the papers, the newspapers negative. No, you see negativity in your fellow men. And it is good for us when we read the cats and dogs letter, because in our society it is used many times to understand what happens with you when you say yes to a theosophical life. That first karmic, uh, expression of acceleration, so criticizing your other members in your own organization, not even in the other organizations, is a sign that you are on the right track and that you have to recognize that and put it beside you because it is in you. That is the mud uh, Helena talked about the mud from former lives that comes up. Criticizing your other fellow man is the first step in growing karmically. And if we recognize that, then the Naiden Declaration has more sense. For what did we declare last year? To uh, live and be as theosophists together in a respectful way. And that is your protection. If you say, I want to do this in a respectful way, then you protect yourself against that mud that criticizing others. 
So if you feel the impulse to criticize someone next to you or whatever, yes, you know, oh, I'm growing, now I have to be careful and forget that criticism. And that is for me the cats and dogs letter. Yes, I hope that this letter will start being alive for everyone here. Thank you for cho choosing that, uh, John. I didn't know that, but I'm very glad that you did. You're welcome, right? Thank you, Joanna. Who, who else? Huh? I was thinking in our class, our secret doctorate class, this same idea. And to come together, like let's say in a marriage, you know, when you come together, you create a safety. And I think what people don't realize is the past karma now is going to come up. <laughs> it has to for all of us. And, and when they see it, people are horrified and they want to run out of the marriage. <laughs> but it's actually a part of life and the most important time to, you know, to stay together and to be understanding. And so creating a safe place of coming together after the cross-pollination <laughs> to, because all the past karma is now going to come up through us. And, and that's a healthy thing, a healthy thing for a union. Thank you. Well, Helena, I think you're right that a marriage is a wonderful place to learn how to understand people. <laughs> to understand yourself. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sometimes the hard way. And John, you picked another piece as well, right? Yes, on your handout, there's another piece here. Oh, oh, can, oh, 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 oh. Before we jump okay. to the other, can I? May yes, I? Sure. May I? Thank you. I, again, I just got to come back to the concept or the idea of the ideal, especially after the last two comments. And looking at the ideal is the true essence of our nature. And the mud, as, and, and again, it's in the teachings as the skandhas of our nature. If we recognize that the truth of our being in communicating is obscured, and that the only thing that obscures it is not us with bad habits, but the way we have used the lives that make up our being, then we can take the approach again of sorrow and sadness and understanding, because then there's no one to blame. There's no person to fight. There's only the obscurations to clarify. And so if we assume that impersonal perspective, which is what we are really, then the rest becomes easy because, again, whether we're knowing ourselves in marriage or we're reflecting upon what, what was just said and why did I think I said it, maybe I should correct it, it becomes a different view of one's own self in the process. And then even if someone is telling us something about us that appears negative. We're not taking it as about ourselves, but about the thing that we're carrying that we simply have to modify or change. So again, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful letter because it points to clarifying a misconception in regard to us as we truly are, the idea of mud, we truly are not, but identifying with the mud, thinking that that's what we are, as well as throwing it on others. So, just a thought. The difference between mud and manure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, <Yeah. laughs> manure is when you transfer, when, let me put it this way, a, a, a gardener and so on, wheat, it's like mud. I mean the weeds, you know. Now, if you pull out the weeds, what does the uh, farmer or garden, the gardener do? You, you pull out the weeds by the roots, and then that becomes the fertilizers in which you plant the seeds to, so that it can grow. Otherwise, how can you plant um, good seed in a soil in which is barren? So in a way, all the negative thoughts and ideas and, and so on, we can convert that 
into a manure, which means if something is negative, you think about the positive, the good, the beautiful, and in that way you transform the mud into a manure and then it can grow. Anyway, I don't know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> so the analogy is really coming to life now, isn't it? <laughs> Great. <laughs> Let's be a garden together with the bees and everything. <laughs> I do want to comment also that in this letter, she's talking about two things here. Not only are, do we need to sow the seeds, but we also need to be the soil. Mm -hmm. So you can't just sow the seeds and walk away and imagine that, okay, my job is done. You need to be the husband, man. You need to make sure that the seeds are um, well cared for, let's say. So that there's two separate steps in this. I thought that was interesting as well. Now the second part of this is not a personal letter from HPB, but it's from around the same time. This is the very conclusion of her book, The Key to Theosophy, in the last section called Conclusion. And I thought it was a nice bookend to this uh, personal letter. You'll notice here the difference in the way she, uh, her tone uh, between a personal letter and her, pub and her public works. She's a, a lot less cranky, let's say. Um, and remember this was written as a catechism so that it's really her asking the questions and then answering the questions. But the questions came from many people who were confused by the secret doctrine and she wanted to do a, a simpler, more direct presentation to those um, who hadn't fathomed the depths yet of the secret doctrine. So she asks, tell me, what do you expect for theosophy in the future? And then answers, if you speak of theosophy, I answer that as it has existed eternally throughout the endless cycles upon cycles of the past, so it will ever exist throughout the infinitudes of the future because theosophy is synonymous with everlasting truth. Pardon me, I meant to ask you rather about the prospects of the Theosophical Society. Its future will depend almost entirely upon the degree of selflessness, earnestness, devotion, and last but not least, on the amount of knowledge and wisdom possessed by those members on whom it will fall to carry on the work and to direct the society after the death of the founders. I quite see the importance of their being selfless and devoted, but I do not quite grasp how their knowledge can be of as vital a factor in the question as these other qualities. Surely the literature which already exists and to which constant additions are still being made ought to be sufficient. I do not refer to technical knowledge of the esoteric doctrine, though that is most important. I spoke rather of the great need which our successors in the guidance of the society will have of unbiased and clear judgment. Every such attempt as the Theosophical Society has hitherto ended in failure because sooner or later it has degenerated into a sect, set up hard and fast dogmas of its own, and so lost by imperceptible degrees that vitality which living truth alone can impart. You must remember that all our members have been bred and born in some creed or religion, that all are more or less their generation both physically and mentally, and consequently that their judgment is but too likely to be warped and unconsciously biased by some or all of these influences. If then, they cannot be freed from such inherent bias or at least taught to recognize it instantly and so avoid being led away by it, 
The result can only be that the society will drift off to some sandbank or th of thought or another, and there remain a stranded carcass to molder and die. But if this danger be averted, then the society will live on into and through the 20th century. It will gradually leaven and permeate the great mass of thinking and intelligent people with its large-minded and noble ideas of religion, duty, and philanthropy. Surely, or slowly but surely, it will burst asunder the iron fetters of creeds and dogmas of social and caste prejudices. It will break down racial and national antipathies and barriers. It will open the way to the practical realization of the brotherhood of all men. Through its teaching, through the philosophy which it has rendered accessible and intelligible to the modern mind, the West will learn to understand and appreciate the East at its true value. Further, the development of the psychic powers and faculties, the premonitory symptoms of which are already visible in America, will proceed healthily and normally. Mankind will be saved from the terrible dangers, both mental and bodily, which are inevitable when that unfolding takes place, as it threatens to do, in a hotbed of selfishness and all evil passions. Man's mental and psychic growth will proceed in harmony with his moral improvement, while his material surroundings will reflect the peace and fraternal goodwill which will reign in his mind instead of the discord and strife which is everywhere apparent around us today. This is a striking contrast, but we're talking about the same thing here. So who would like to comment? I think, uh, again, it's a double edge, if you will. We need to stick with what is really true and eternal. At the same time, we need to be open to other people's opinions. But as she says, many of us, and certainly I can say for myself, have been influenced by the religion we were brought up in. And it's not that difficult to misjudge or to bring in other aspects that could degenerate very slightly and therefore not easily seen uh, the real more eternal and lasting truth. Thank you, Richard. Who else would like to reflect? Gareth? Well, I'm kind of struck by the phrase here about in the middle of the page about uh, our judgments are but too likely to be warped and unconsciously biased. And then uh, she mentions further on the next line that uh, we should be taught to recognize it, that bias, uh, and not be led away by it. So going back to the previous letter, which I think is a little bit of a H.P. Blavatsky sort of letting go and, and, and letting her own personality get in there a little bit, as she's entitled to. Uh, as you say, this is much more sober uh, view. And in both cases, we start with the problem and the manure and the difficulty, which from my point of view comes from the lower self and our tendency, our bias towards selfishness and materialism, our many illusions uh, coming from Maya. And in this idea of finding our own unconscious bias is really important, I think, finally, modern psychology is waking up to the idea that theosophy is implanted, that we all have this lower self, and we're very often unconscious of it. And the great thing about study and meditation and action is that together they allow us 
to be more conscious of our own inner mind. And the real battle isn't with critics outside. It's with our own inner self, our own critic. And the idea that if we're aware of this bias, then we don't overreact because we realize the other person is biased as well. And they're entitled to that bias. We respect that. But it's that opportunity, it's the manure that gives us the opportunity then to bring it to a higher plane, as Madame Blavatsky does in both sides of this wonderful uh, set of extracts. And in each case, she gives us the ideal to keep in mind, the compassion. And as Jesus taught us, we really have to have compassion for the person who is persecuting us. And as Buddha would say, that's our greatest teacher. It's the greatest challenge. It forces us to really be in control of our own emotions and to be aware of them so we don't fall in the trap of going on to the lower bases and simply having a fight, cats and dogs. So uh, I love the way both of these come out with, with analysis and finally as always in theosophy, uh, pointing to the higher vision. Thank you, Gareth. <clears throat> Who else would like to reflect? Yes, please. I'm just reminded of a comment would, that Tim Would Boyd, you please stand up? Oh, Thank you very I'm much. I'm just reminded of a comment. It's, this isn't my comment, but I heard Tim Boyd say it yest yesterday. Okay. Um, it's not only east and west, is it? We are also looking at north and south. And so it's an ongoing process. And, and I can remember a long time ago when I was having a conversation in a theology group with a person, a European, who had married a Muslim and was incredibly enthusiastic about adopting Islam mm -hmm. and was talking to me about... God having spoken. And I just said, what about God speaking? <laughs> and so for me, it's, it's, it's a letter about being continuously open-minded and listening. So this is a wonderful example of cross-pollination that you're talking about. You're within the marriage, actually. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, being open-minded and avoiding pitfalls. Who else would like to comment? Thinking about these things throughout the year, <laughs> um, I was thinking of religions and how we unpeel to ourselves and in our relationships, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we're sharing our woundedness, you know, in the past when we tried to connect and we were blocked with other people. So when we're cats and dogs, our wounds, we're showing our wounds to be healed, to, to be reconnected, because in the past, somewhere, if you look at religion, it's sort of a history of the evolution of our connection to the divine, and we refined it, you know, with each commandment, with each generation, with each race. But HPB doesn't want us to get further away with all these constructs. She wants us to go elevate to something we can't even describe, but we experience, and elevates and travel with it and, and not get so caught up in the words and the thoughts and the astral pollution in the mud. that we miss, yes. yeah, we're in the mud and not, yeah. yeah. That's all. Thank you. Let's go to the panel. Gentlemen. Some of the comments there reminded me of the Dalai Lama speaking in Chicago, uh, and he said that, he didn't want you to be a Buddhist. He wants you to be a better Christian or a better Muslim or a better Hindu. And reminds me what we're looking at here is I don't want you to be all one big theosophical society. I want you to be a better student of ULT or I want you to be a better uh, Theosophical Society of Point Loma student, or I want you to be a better Adyar Theosophist. And I think that in order to do that, we give up these prejudices that we're all born with in the Theosophical movement and look around to see beyond that. 
And also, according to the first letter, to stop being cats and dogs. Start, you know, grow up a little bit, take a look and be open and be compassionate with our fellow Theosophists. Brotherhood's got to start right here with Theosophists before we can talk about brotherhood out there in the world. So our nucleus needs a little work. Yes. G? Herman? Well, if I was, uh, can react on the letter and maybe on another part, what I find quite positive, that is the last part, then the society will live on. And for me that is also, uh, let's say, something very hopeful because we are already past the 20th century. So, that means that the society and the whole movement has already go to a type of uh, deep moment in the curve and now we are, have the responsibility to push on. Yeah? So you can say the foundation is, is there and our responsibility is, is to push on now because now and then she say gradually it will level and so on and so on. So I think I found in myself quite an, an hopeful information in it. Yeah? It's very clear, I think, this uh, this passage because he he gives the qualities we need. We, you're, you're always on a crossroad, and what you need is selflessness, earnestness, devotion, and knowledge and wisdom. And if you have that, you you will go the right direction. And if you don't have it, well, it will be uh, sacked and it will de degenerate. And it's it's so easy. Well, it's very easy. It's very clear. No, it's, it's, it's very easy. It's very clear. It's very, very easy. No, it's very easy. Just be selfish, <laughs> earnest, devoted, and try to be, uh, uh, to, to, to get a knowledge and try to uh, get a wisdom and have an open mind for this. You don't have to think everything is difficult. Uh, Sometimes it's very easy. <laughs> you sound so optimistic. Great stuff. All right. Thank you. <laughs> There are always different ways to read the same letter, uh -huh. right? <laughs> um, it says that uh, if the society will live on through the 20th century, it will gradually live on and permeate the great mass of thinking and intelligent people. If we take a look at the society today, mm -hmm. we may finally find that there is no thinking and intelligent people, maybe, in the world. Or maybe we've not completely averted the danger. Because that's the two options she is uh, giving us. Which means that's perhaps something we want to take a look a little bit. Because the world is in a bad shape today. Yes. Nobody can uh, say differently. Averting the danger means that we need to identify clearly where we've been failing a little bit our mission there before going further ahead. Ah. It's a type of, you know, in any project, you stop at any time and you try to see really, realistically, what are the outcomes, what are the results. And from that, you can identify the failure and correct them and keep going. So you're saying we need to reflect a little bit on that. I have a feeling that if we are satisfied with the current situation inside uh -huh. the stream of theosophy, why the world is such in a bad shape. Yes. So it's okay to be very optimistic like balance, but at the same time, we need to reflect and yes. take a good look at yeah. where we went. Yes. Be realistic. Yes. Thank you. Hmm. Can I uh, twist that? Around? Yes. Not, not, not that per se, <laughs> but, but um, in, in, in a sense, piggyback on Barron because in playing with this, in looking at one side versus the other, I, I say to myself, on one side, the first side, we've got true personality and individuals that live in the personality and perhaps what the consequences of that are. The second side, she begins with an interesting comment after the question, tell me what you expect for theosophy. So there's, in her answer, a purposeful misunderstanding. If you speak of theosophy, I answer that it has existed eternally 
throughout the endless cycles upon cycles of the past. So it will ever exist throughout the infinitudes of the future because theosophy is synonymous with everlasting truth. And what is that? That's what our nature is. And so from personality, she brings us to true nature, which is everlasting truth. And then it's twisted again. Pardon me, I'm not talking about everlasting truth. <laughs> Tell me about the Theosophical Society. Here we go with personality again. And so she says, all right, if you want to drag it down, and if you want to, again, misunderstand who you are and act from your position of misunderstanding, okay, then it depends upon the degree of selfishness, as we just heard from Baron, earnestness, devotion, and last but not least, on the amount of knowledge and wisdom. And what did he suggest? That that's easy. And why is it easy? Because, again, she's telling us it's our nature. Now, we can think about knowledge and all of that from the perspective of the personality, but if you piggyback it on the first comment, eternal, everlasting truth, which is our nature, these qualities are nature, are, are our nature. These are inherent. This is what we are. Not who we are. This is what we are. But if we persist in believing that we are who we are, then again, we've got this long situation of events that unfold and things that we have to do. And then we come to a situation or a condition where the world appears to be worse off than it was. And yet, if we're looking optimistically and if we believe that we are the light and if we believe that the light is beginning to shine, what does sunlight do? Brings to life those seeds that are germinating. And if it just happens to be that the seeds are seeds of personality, as those seeds begin to burn and burn and burn because we're getting rid of them, it appears that the world is in a much worse place than it is. So if we really want to be optimistic, which is what this letter is supposed to be about, we can turn the whole thing around and say, wow, the world looks like it's in a bad place. We look like we can't talk and understand with each other because more of our true nature is shining through and it's stirring up a lot of stuff, as someone said, karma, skandhas, nature, that we now have to reflect on. That's what she says. We just have to reflect on it, understand that it's not us, but our stuff, and then we can link up with that common humanity that we are. So it's a weird way of reading the letter, but it's an interesting way to read the letter. So just the thoughts. And, and, and then perhaps in, in reflecting, it's, it's good not to do it alone, right? So, so we have a great opportunity to reflect together or to unpeel together, to be brave together. Yes, Joanna? Can I react on this? I like very much what you said. And that is the same where John started tonight. Uh, it is, uh, they are disgusted. They look on and so on. That first sentence of the first uh, paragraph. Uh, and you said she was a little bit, how do you, do you call it, crumpy? Cranky. <laughs> Cranky, yes. But... In fact, it is very nice to me when the masters would have be disgusted. For that means that they are even interested in our society. We are still a useful instrument in the hands of the masters, for that is the only reason to be disgusted. Otherwise, they will be disinterested. Yes, we have no use anymore. So if we are against all rules, and no one asks himself, what are those rules? Yes, those rules and the rules of the, our brotherhood, very interesting to think of that. And if we break those rules, and they are disgusted, it means they act as our uh, educators. 
And that is a very good relationship. We talked about the masters and the lodge of compassion this afternoon. And if there is a connection, TS and the lodge still at this moment, then I would be very happy when they are disgusted <laughs> when we are breaking the rules. For otherwise, if they don't react, there's no uh, reason to exist for a theosophical society. So I'm glad I uh, go with Barend. It's a very positive thing <laughs> that they are disgusted. Another very optimistic sound, yes. Yes, well, certainly. And, and I do agree that I think they are still very, very much interested in this great experiment. And if they were disgusted, or let's say disappointed, back in 1890, how would they feel today? Take a look at your cells, at your little groups, or your organizations. If in 1890 she's complaining that they were living like cats and dogs, what are we doing today? And <laughs> and that's, that's a great place to be. That's the step in the right direction. And, and, and sometimes to have a good conversation together instead of fighting like cats and dogs, it's good to have some guidelines. And uh, I think in your envelope or in your envelope of goodies, there's, there's another goodie in there. There's an article there. And perhaps, uh, Herman, could you say something about yeah. the article? Yeah, yeah, sure something that we can use as a means of conversation. Uh, let's say a few uh, things first. Um, it is an article that was uh, created uh, uh, by Barrett uh, Forham and me. And the main thing is how to prove theosophy and where is this idea coming from? Because quite often you see or you read that people say, well, Theosophy, HPB, uh, 1875, old stuff, old examples, uh, what is the use in it, how can you prove it, and, and so on, and so on. So, we are thinking about to address this a little bit and say, well, you, first you should realize that what was HPB doing, and special, for instance, in the secret doctrine, she has a lot of information over there. But she has also the habit, by giving the information, to start in, in the lines between it, a conversation with a certain signed guy or an other uh, expert somewhere, and uh, running out a discussion that, yes, uh, if you change this, then I think you come closer to the truth, and so on, and so on. So people quite often come to the conclusion that that are old examples. And that was then and not now. And we say you should realize the following, that, uh, that examples, you should study them. Because studying them in the time setting of that moment, because they mean something in the mentality and the way at looking at it. So if you start to realize what was the real meaning of the conversation, you can come much closer to the real meaning of the secret doctrine. And now for ourselves, we can think about examples of modern time. But the main important thing is that if you are not studying in an active way, and it sounds for you reasonable, you can easily come to the conclusion, oh yes, yeah, I think it is true. And then you accept this on a level of belief. And to accept this on a level of belief has no real value to you or to the society where you are a part of it. Because it is just a belief like we have many beliefs in this world. So we think you should do something. And if you start to really dig in and ask for yourself how far I'm able to prove it. And that can be hard. Because if you're speaking about the deep wisdom of the secret doctrine of the Theosophia, it can be quite a subject what is maybe taking this life or even more than this life to coming to a deep understanding. And then you we try to say you should 
also do the steps and try to believe it, not in the, uh, let's say, passive way, but try to study for yourself how far I am able to experience in my own daily life what she's telling here as a true. Uh, so that you really, let's say, have the experience. If you have the experience yourself, or let's say in a small level you have that experience, then you can say, okay, I was not able to experience the whole meaning of what she is saying. I'm only able to experience a small part of it. And then you should be happy because then you can say, okay, I was able to experience it up to a certain level. And by other parts reasoning for HPB, what you also experience up to a certain level, you can say the same thing and say, okay, I have confident in her saying. So that means that I'm able to experience it at up to a certain level. And for the time being, I will accept it as a type of a hypothesis so that in the time I hope to grow and experience it myself more deeper so that I can put my extending, my understanding on a little bit higher level. Yeah? So if you look from that point of view, the real understanding of the meaning is that you make that wisdom yourself and you experience that wisdom in daily life. Okay, that is maybe a little bit of utopia in a couple of situations. But the main thing is that you should realize that you have to be active searching in life to experience in your life. Because if she is bringing a universal truth, that means that also above as below and below as above, we should be able to find this true in small in our daily experience. So that means active state of mind, looking around, testing for yourself, overthinking her statement so that we could grow up in that wisdom. And then we stepping away from, let's say, a very passive belief. And that is a way of growing in wisdom. Yeah? So and that is an important thing. So if you look on the secret doctrine and all the writings of uh, the Theosophia and from HPB and all the good writers and, and GDP and so on, it means always that studying it is not a matter of reading it and yes, okay, it sounds good to me, I think it is so. No, there is a challenge, there is a duty in it to experience and test it in your whole life. If you don't test it, you don't will grow, you don't will become better in spreading theosphere, you are only to spread it as a type of belief. So, do you understand the difference in the three levels, belief, confident, and really becoming that wisdom? Yeah? And if you're really sitting in confident and wants to grow to becoming that wisdom, then the secret doctrine is a living guide for you in your life, and you have to recognize it yourself. And if you don't recognize it at immediately, and that happens quite often, you have to think about it. Yeah? That is the reason that we give the example of Newton's law. If you do the observation and you dropped two uh, things, like a feather and a piece of lead, and the drops, they never come on the same time on the floor. Although, still Newton say, yes, in principle, all subjects all material forms drop with the same speed. So if you do it yourself, the observation, you are not able to have that confidence because it is your seeing, your experience is not telling you the truth. I personally was in the situation to be in German, in Bremen, they have a special tower, they take out all the air and they drop this type of things in a vacuum tower And then you see that they're really falling on the same speed and touching the ground in the same time. So they teach me, yes, the principle of Newton is right. The only thing what you have to realize that in daily life, there is an obstacle in your observation. There is air, and the air gives disturbance in the speed of dropping for the feather and not for the lead. So you have to overthink it for yourself. And if you know once this is true, you always will recognize, yes, 
What I see is not the real behavior of the material, because there is a disturbance in it, and that is the air. Okay, I was in the situation to see it myself, and that is in theosophy exactly the same. If you don't take the step to overthink it and to test it in daily life, and it can take some time, and if you find the truth in daily life, then you can make a stop more. Then you have that experience within yourself, yeah? within your, how do you say that, your spent of wisdom, that you say, yes, did I have experience myself? That is not an absolute. That is just a step in becoming more into the direction of wisdom, become more wiser. Yeah? And we have to realize that in this way, wisdom is always something relative to your state of mind. Some person is much further in overthinking all these things and have experienced much more in daily life than other persons. Yeah? So we should realize that the absolute truth is never sitting in a being, in a conscious being, because every being has its limitations. Yeah? We can help each other by pointing out, yes, if you look like this, and if you look here, and if you look there, then you can experience how it is, and that is this, the way we can help each other. But you have to realize, and that is the main thing, what we like to put here on the table, that there are three levels to approach it, and that we don't want to make theosophy a belief, we like to experience that truth. And if we have experienced that truth, we have a much higher motivation and we are much more able to spread it to our fellow men. I think those are extremely valuable comments. And I would just like to elaborate on one part of the, of the points. As a student of world history, what I've noticed, and particularly in trying to answer student questions, is that human beings do have a capacity to figure things out. I mean, we're living in an environment of technological innovation, aesthetic improvement, and all of that. And it's fantastic what human beings have figured out. It seems to me that in recent decades, perhaps through uh, negative experience long ago, we figured out how to work in small groups to create a nucleus of productive creativity and harmony. There are thousands upon thousands of what are called NGOs, nonprofit organizations, around the world doing all kinds of projects. Uh, Santa Barbara's home, for instance, to direct relief. And these, these small groups, some of which become quite large, are really the most active source of doing good. Uh, they're far ahead of governments. And I think that theosophical groups have figured out how to create a nucleus um, of brotherhood and dedication to welfare. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm not saying that every group is perfect or something. So I think something we've figured out how to be productive and how to reach out. So we should have confidence in that accomplishment. Uh, a nucleus of brotherhood is not beyond our reach. The problem is that we are now, as we reach out and have a broader experience and maybe a broader goal of, in the world of globalization, is that there's uh, higher levels, if you will, of knowledge that we need. We need. Um, we, if part of the teaching is that all these, all these 7.3 billion human beings that are now incarnated have lived countless lives, and they've accum accumulated immense amounts of karma some of which we'd say good, bad, indifferent, or whatever. And so if we look at some of the world's challenges way beyond our small groups, um, it boggles the mind. And we're, I think we are facing a future, 
all through the century, <laughs> many centuries to come, of ha having to gain knowledge about how to work with uh, people, how to do the best we can, when every one of us is a very large um, baggage of karma. <laughs> So that's where, so we have a bigger task ahead, but all the more reason that we gain strength from where we can gain strength, and that's from the, uh, these nucleus, uh, uh, the nuclei of brotherhood, uh, and to not only strengthen that, but to build bridges um, and, um, and uh, increase our understanding. So the teaching, it does give us some very fundamental lessons that we have learned, but the teaching is also <laughs> pointing to a very large, complex path ahead. Uh, from what Herman said, uh, first, uh, we don't live in a vacuum. So uh, I, I think part of what we have to do as working theosophists is, of course, learn the teachings but uh, it takes, as you, as you said, to get out there and be active and practice them to be effective with them. Because it's not so easy to uh, give people what they need in the world, you know. In, in the world, the feather doesn't drop at the same speed as the, uh, as the piece of lead. I know uh, on the moon they did that and it worked pretty well. The astronauts actually did that experiment. But, um, so I, I guess I'm saying the more we can try to apply the teachings, the more, uh, you know, the better we'll be at, at actually helping others. You know, I, I can't help but to think of the, the old adage that the, that the road to hell is paved with good intentions, you know. So we need the knowledge and we need the practice to go along with it. And I think, uh, you know, the more we do that, the more we'll be effective as a movement. Anyway. So yeah, right there's, there's one yeah. thing, Dave, what you should realize is that what uh, also the meaning is of what we try to say here is that if you want to reach out with theosophy, it is not sufficient to say to your fellow man, look here, Blavatsky was writing this and this and this. Right. So it must be true. No, that doesn't work. So that means we have to ignite in them a type of activity that they start to search out and recognize this truth for themselves. Right. Yeah? Yeah, I, I think so. But and I, then I, spreading. Yeah. 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 Also, though, you, you bring to my mind the fact that uh, take education. Children, you can talk to them all day. If you've had, everybody that has kids knows that. But they go by your example, not what you say. So we have to, like you say, be living examples besides offering uh, the intellectual teachings. So, so which is incumbent on us to keep working on ourselves. We, yeah, we can't well, forget a couple, that. Yeah. A couple of weeks ago, we had an, uh, a symposium about education. And there we come to the conclusion that the best what you can do with the children is not telling them how something is. No, ask them to, on themselves to experience and explain by themselves who things are. Because then it has to come from their inner out instead of People are putting it in from the outside, yeah? So, if, if you can hear me with this. So I would sum it up the, uh, with an axiom that I like very much. Experience is your best teacher. I can, I can I might make even another example, not of uh, Newton, but uh, just the, f the first uh, chapters of the secret doctrine, it's telling about uh, the cosmogenesis. Eh? <laughs> so the how the cosmos came into being. Which of you did understand it the first time you read it? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> so you can, I think, you can say, well, I take it for granted because Blavatsky is a wise woman, so it should be true. But for instance, you can say, now, let's, let's try to translate it to my personal life. What, what did she say? Well, and if you, you are talking about reincarnation, you are talking about cycles, you're talking about a period of rest, a period of inactivity, and then a period of activity. Can you recognize that in nature? Yes, of course you can recognize it. You have the four seasons, yeah? You can recognize it in your daily life. And then, I don't say that you have proof the, the, the first chapter, so the first uh, part of uh, the secret doctrine, but at least it's a little bit reasonable. 
Yeah, well, and if you go on like that, it will take some time, but after a year, years, or maybe some lives, it, it, it's something you don't take for granted. It's not just a belief, but you can recognize it and you see the examples all around you. So that's the second uh, level of understanding. The third level, the highest level, is when you really are that wisdom. And that is, I think, just for the very high chelas and the masters themselves. But uh, we can uh, try to, 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 <laughs> to grow in our consciousness and uh, to try to be on our plane a little bit like that. Yeah. Mm. I just want to say a unity, but still theosophy, theosophical society and community is limited. Possibly we cannot uh, uh, deny that more wisdom outside of current uh, theosophic society. So how you can reach this unity, this non-theosophical people who also has a wisdom and a great experience, especially this naturalist who are doing the advanced research in natural sciences and also computer sciences. Good so question. my question is I'm, I'm how you can reach this. An answer here. Yeah. Do, you, do you understand the question? Not completely. Then, Could you repeat the question, please? Uh, theosophical, beside we, we can claim a unity mm -hmm. in the, between theosophical societies, between theosophists, but still much more uh, research and wisdom outside of the theosophical movement especially from scientists, advanced and new technologies developers, uh, how you can enrich the philosophical uh, movement how from okay. this movement and how to... And probably they also may talk different language, uh -huh. yeah. but wisdom is common. Yes. So how can we cross-pollinate with the wisdom how, outside? Yeah. Okay. How to make yes. a, a benefit from common wisdom? Because I believe that what Theosophy is bringing is a, a special, okay, a correct esoteric thinking, and somebody is uh, practicing Theosophy thinking this way, and somebody is not practicing, but also has this, the same elements of wisdom and the same element of thinking. And how do we link with those? That's, yes, that's how your do question. we link and not link probably, first of all, for Theosophical Society, how we benefit yes. of outside wisdom, not theosophic. I'm not saying esoteric, because esoteric wisdom is common for theosophists, not theosophists. But only between this group of... Good question. You have the question now? Would I you like to so. comment? I yeah? think so. Let's give it a try. Um, I think in the first place you should say that if you speak about universal wisdom, yeah, what also is com, uh, called, sometimes called dharma, is a universal wisdom, so that it is not a wisdom that is only belonging to theosophists, or it is only a wisdom what is, let's say, find in uh, the theosophical publications. You should realize that if you speak universal wisdom, you will find it everywhere. But the theosophy as we know it, and the theosophia, is able to explain it in the deep and, let's say, universal meaning. Yeah? So we will find a lot of explanations by science people how material will behave. Yeah? And within their limited knowledge and in their observations, that is true for them. But if you want to make it, uh, let's say, see it in a wider uh, dimension, it will not fit. And then you need a knowledge what is higher, what is more universal. Yeah? Uh, for instance, the ideas of gravity. What is gravity? Science has an idea. No, science has no idea what gravity is. They have only in description how it behaves. So what are we searching for? We search for an understanding what it is really is. Yeah? So from that point of view, I think it is part of our duty to study theosophy and also try to apply it in a very wide sense of the applications in the total world. Yeah? Yeah, maybe I, uh, I would like to add something in other words, uh, talking about the same. I think we should uh, distinguish between scientific theories, because you are talking about technology, how the wisdom from outside theosophical circles 
can strengthen or add something to theosophical insights. So we should distinguish between scientific theories and plain and sound scientific facts. These are two different things. If we talk about scientific theories, then we see that in the course of time, these theories uh, which uh, try to explain certain phenomena in, in the physical world, change over time. We see first Newtonian theories about gravity, then we see relativity theories, and so on. Um, from the point of uh, theosophy, we can say that we have always universal type of views on those things, and that we welcome very much the facts which we, from science, which we consider our friends, because we say that if theosophy is correct, then the visions we can deduct from theosophy are not so depending on time, because they are universal type of ideas, and that the clean facts that science uh, establishes are always the friends of theosophy because they underline that these universal ideas from theosophy always prove in the end to be correct. So that is why I say distinguish between theories and between facts, and the facts are always the friends of the universal views, the theosophical views that we try to put forward. I, I want to comment. I, I was also had a discussion with some of my friends, not theosophists, definitely. Uh, that was, I didn't check. That's why we all have a question. Uh, the, my friend is told that uh, we are talking about philosophy, philosophers. But Platon and Archimedes were not philosophers. The, the word philosoph philosophy became usable probably much later than they did their research as a physicist, metaphysicist. So philosophy came later than uh, humanity acquired a lot of uh, experience. And it was possible to think and argue in concept of philosophy. But before this, they mostly was observing also religion is also actually based on, you can read also from Blavatsky, that uh, religion is actually based from initial experience. And uh, what Havis was developed in religion and philosophy is a, a gradation of the abstraction that people created based on the limited observation of the nature. So this is, I'm not sure about philosophy and, and, and physics in the ancient world, but this is probably like question. I would like okay. myself to Great. research. Yeah. You're setting up an interesting dialogue here. There's a couple of people who would like to comment, I think, here. Jan? Yes, I would like to react to what uh, Herman said, actually, and I step a little bit out of the science bit. But as on how we can apply the teachings, as on how we can convey them, and, and really present them to the world at large. I mean, this is what we do, how to prove theosophy. Mm -hmm. How can we make it? And I don't even know if that English word exists. How can, we, how can we make it provable, right? How can we really make it something that we can touch? So I'd like to share with you just a small little story that I encountered you know, with some of my students. I, I teach English conversation in Brazil, and two of my students are judges, and they are heavily involved in the unveiling of the corruption that is going on in Brazil. And then they sit in my classroom and they see these portraits of uh, HPB and all the others. And then they say, well, you know, do theosophists have an answer <laughs> to the question that we have to go through this turmoil and through all these difficult times just to unveil corruption? And then I just tell them about the sevenfold principle. And then I try to explain to them that we are in a phase of development uh, Johanna would call it a class, and the class in which we are right now has everything to do with the struggle of Kama Manas and Bodhi Manas. And that is something that we can prove something with. But what it comes down to, it's about the light and the dark. 
And when we really study that, and, and it is not so complex to, to convey that to non-theosophists, so there where we can prove it, that you know, when people are really hopeless, because some of them, um, you know, who are really trying to set out uh, on their journey to clean up Brazil, they lose hope. They really are hopeless, because every time they think they have unveiled something, something else turns up. And then I tell them, it's about the light and the dark. It's about the potential. And when there is potential, there is this counter force. And with that, they go home and they say, yes, you're right. That's a theosophical principle that we can apply, and we can easily prove it. Because when there is a lot of goodness, at the same time, you see the opposite. And just as a reaction to what you said, Herman. Thank you, Jan. Um, with, yes, Jo. Well, coming back on the, the previous uh, speaker, yes. <laughs> uh, whether, whether we are talking about philosophy or science is not really uh, something I want to go into now, but I just want to add to the conversation that we had first Plato, whether we call it a scientist or a philosopher, is, is not so important. But Plato advocated the approach of the so-called deductive approach in how to tackle issues and to find truth. His pupil, Aristotle, changed that concept into the inductive method, which is first doing studies, studying phenomena, and then trying to, to uh, come to conclusions by, uh, by studying those phenomena. And that is a, a completely different approach. And until now, actually, we see in our world that this inductive approach is still more or less uh, prevailing over the de deductive method. While we from theosophy say that there is very much logic in trying to always first start with the deductive method, to start with universal principles that are in line with, for instance, the three fundamental propositions of the secret doctrine, and then see if you can, in your reasoning and in your facts that you find, see that everything lines up from the most universal principles that you have until the detailed theories or hypotheses you are investigating. And if you do that, you are always working in a consistent system of thinking, while the other way around, that is, very popular in our Western society is that you do it the other way around. Instead of uh, trying to understand the nature of copper, you start investigating each and every item you can find which is made from copper. And that is not the really approach that gives a lot of progress and fast progress. That was my additional comment. There's a nice example about that. Dalai Lama about 10 years ago visited a congress about uh, neuropsychology. And all the professionals who were there detested him being there because it, he, why is he here? He's, he's a Buddhist, he's, he's a priest, he's a monk, he shouldn't be here. And then they discovered that he was uh, really up to speed conversing with them. But from a different perspective, from the deductive perspective. And he said, you know, those things you're talking about here, the principles that apply here, we've been teaching them for 2,000 years, right? But then the scientist asked him, but we approach this from a different perspective. So we look for proof first, and then we try to find out, as Joop explained, the inductive way, you know, what the rules behind it are. So what are you going to do if we find a fact that proves you wrong? Then Dalai Lama said, well, then I'll, I'll be the first to acknowledge. Right, so, so there's the, the place where the two should meet. Um, can, can I, can yes, I, please. Just trying to, I, I, I haven't cleared this up in my head yet, so if it's more confusing, then that's, that's just typical of me, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but but the, the ideas that arise in my mind have to do with the nature of a Mahatma or the nature of, you know, and the word is, you know, of a, of a master one who has truly understood 
and mastered, if you would, the seven principles of their nature, as was mentioned. If that process is a possible process, and if it does occur, what it implies is that on each plane of existence, as many subplanes, if you want to kind of call from those main seven, there is clarity, there is understanding, there is perception, there is interpretation, there is experimentation, all of which are different. And if they are using the deductive method, they are watching that truth formulate itself in different ways, on different levels, and understanding that, contemplating that, working with that even down to the material plane. The question then becomes, how do you explain, as was said, multiple truths that have no words for their expression? And so in the process, we create a different mode of communication, just like here. And then we work from the bottom up. The bottom up is part of the particular. And Aristotle is just as important as Plato if you're going to master the nature of your being that coincides with the nature of nature. And so it's not an issue of being a philosopher. It's not an issue of being a scientist of phenomena. But it is an issue of being a scientist of the soul in its ramifications with nature. And then as the teachers said themselves, even if they were to explain to you most of the ideas that you're looking for, having not the words that you use in your typical vocabulary, how would you understand it? And so the basis is a simple one, live the life to know the teaching, which is about going through that process, knowing what that process is, and learning how to disidentify. And, and, and this is just an everyday, simple, practical life. Disidentify with erroneous conceptions. And if you think about it, the majority of thoughts that we have are wrong even about ourselves and what we think we are, again, as opposed to what we really are. So part of the scientific method is really about, number one, knowing what we are, and then number two, seeing how what we are unfolds from above, below, and then works its way from below to above, and then we can dialogue. We can have a talk about philosophy. We can have a talk about science. We can talk about embryology. We can talk about cosmology. It doesn't matter. We can talk about ethnology. It's just a language that we're using to communicate from different perspectives, neither perspective being more real or true than the other, but simply for the convenience of human nature at this time in our existence. So, Gene, what you're saying is that because we're so full of beliefs, yeah. as a Correct. way of saying, you know, if we, if we realize that, yeah, yeah. if we realize yeah. that, the erroneous nature of many of our thoughts, it's much easier to communicate together. It is. And the common basis for that communication, if we ask ourselves honestly, what is it that I am and what is it that I am not, clears up the battlefield so that we can disidentify with what we're not. No more cats and dogs. No more cats and dogs. There are things that we use as opposed to identifying them as what we are. Vincent? Let me offer uh, one more flower. Ah. <laughs> um, the, it, it, eight people have asked him, mentioned you know, in the, that in the study of the secret doctrine, the key, and that's also true among ourselves, each one will receive or understand 
depending on his own current experience, consciousness, and knowledge. So what, whatever, whoever we are talking, it will, uh, it one of us will depend on uh, what our experience, our knowledge, and and and, and, uh, and consciousness. So, um, so it means then we are thinking of what even modern uh, you know people understand that the way you think determines how you behave, or you, the way you imagine determines how you behave. You know, where there's no vision, where there's no vision, people perish. So again, it, you have to start from a larger view. So, uh, in terms of our own experience, knowledge, and consciousness, it means then that, from what has been said, we are all then wherever we are in terms of our knowledge, experience, we are capable of greater experience, greater consciousness, expanding. It's going to be constant expanding. Uh, no, greater knowledge. Because in our true nature, as was pointed out earlier, we have infinite experience, infinite wisdom, infinite consciousness. So I like to link that up to what we discussed earlier about having a you know, large minded, remember the theosophy, give us, enable us to have large minded uh, understanding of, of uh, religion duty and philanthropy and and it will be connected if you make connection because this is where we have religion what does it mean again in today it says religion in a way connect with more selflessness so that's something we can test in our own experience are we more selfless are we more sympathetic it has to be constantly expanding because most of the time we're narrowing it's expanding, expanding constantly. Am I expanding my view of sympathy, selflessness? And then when it comes to uh, duty, again, connect with earlier, earnestness. Because without determination, courage, because without that, no knowledge is possible. And then philanthropy then connect with devotion. Devotion, remember, he also said duty is devotion to the interests of others. So, when, so, so and, and, and William can judge and say that, so what we should be doing really in terms of our own experience, constantly expanding our sympathies, not narrowing our sympathies. That's how we then move towards bringing truly our humanity. But anyway, that's all that I can say. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. So let's keep our minds open, right? Thank you very much. Maybe this is a good note to start closing. Yeah. Then we have Jan Kind, who's going to tell us some you know things I we have, really... I have never seen them speechless. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just look at them. They're not talking. Okay, we started off with silence, and I told you lots of things were coming your way, and you all said it through, and we admire that, because you came from far. And I saw some eyes closing and, you know, but I think the discussion was very interesting and very lively. We wish you a very good night, but don't go away yet, because I have to tell you that tomorrow morning, breakfast will be served as from 6.30 onwards.